on this Wednesday night. Tony Clement, uh, at my request, has uh, resigned from caucus. How a veteran politician's sexting caused his career to unravel, and how his party handled the scandal. The day after the midterms, Jeff Sessions is out as U.S. Attorney General. Why the timing may not be coincidental. We contributed to sealing the cruel fates of far too many at places like Auschwitz. And a Canadian apology 80 years after this country refused to accept a ship filled with Jewish refugees. We'll hear from a man who was on board. This is The National. Longtime conservative Tony Clement's political career came crashing down today over a scandal of his own making. Clement admitted to texting sexually explicit messages and videos to a woman, and he said someone then tried to blackmail him. Catherine Cullen has the latest on the fallout. Here we go, hands up. He couldn't have been happy to answer questions about Tony Clement's sexting. But this morning, Andrew Shear was prepared to stand by him. Well, obviously very disappointed. Has he done this before, do you think, or is this the first time? I'm taking Tony at his word that this is, uh, that, that this is uh, the, the first time that this has happened. That was uncomfortable for Conservatives. Hi, I was just wondering if I could ask you about Tony Clement. No. We're just asking everybody whether he should, he's still welcome in caucus or not. No? No. But within hours, uncomfortable became intolerable. Tony Clement, uh, at my request, has uh, resigned from caucus. Um, there were, uh, you know, I took him at his word that uh, this was an isolated incident. incident. Since then, there have been numerous reports of, of other incidents, uh, allegations. The reports he's referring to are claims on social media, women saying they weren't surprised by Clement's revelation. And there's another concern hanging over all of this. Do you have a concern with an MP being blackmailed? Or, or I, I have great confidence in the law enforcement agencies who have been tasked with looking into that matter. Clement was a member of the Select National Security and Intelligence Committee with access to highly sensitive information. Some wonder how that could play into what Clement has called an extortion attempt. Committee members are tight-lipped. We had all kinds of security training and we're not allowed to talk about anything. But this former CSIS analyst says they probably don't focus on the most sensitive information. I would imagine that uh, they would be discussing things at a very high level. Uh, they wouldn't get in the nitty-gritty of, well, where did you get that from? It was that a human source? Was that a signals intelligence source? Still, for conservatives, losing a political veteran remains a blow. You know, I've been around for a long time now. I've been around national politics uh, for over 20 years. And you'd think I'd seen it all. As he now watches his own political downfall. Catherine, what do we know about these other allegations that the conservative leader Andrew Scheer was talking about today? Rosemary, he did say that they were social media posts, and he gave no indication that the Conservatives had actually confirmed any of the information in them. But it seems the allegations themselves are enough to end Clement's time with the Conservative caucus. Now, since these reports came to light, several people have said on social media that they weren't necessarily surprised. CBC News hasn't been able to independently verify the claims, but we've spoken to several young women who say that they were uncomfortable and that their friends were uncomfortable when, so, when Tony Clement was liking their social media posts and pictures. Okay, Catherine, thanks for this. You're welcome. And we can tell you more about a sexual misconduct scandal in the Ontario Conservative Party. Today, Premier Doug Ford explained why he withheld the real reason Economic Development Minister, the former one, Jim Wilson, resigned on Friday. When we sat down with the person that gave the allegations, uh, they repeatedly asked us not to make this a media story. And I want to make sure that every single person on our team at Queen's Park knows they're going to have a safe environment, and if they come forward, they're going to be protected. Now, Wilson said nothing about those allegations when he quit his cabinet post and announced he was going to rehab last week, and neither did the Premier's office. Ford now says investigators are looking into allegations against Wilson and former communications staffer Andrew Kimber, who also quit on Friday. Here's what else we're working on tonight on The National. Ever Google your doctor? We take a look at the business behind one popular rate and review website. Why what you find online might not be all you need to know. 
Plus, the Prime Minister has issued a formal apology for turning away a boatload of Jewish people trying to escape the Nazis. Tonight, we meet the people who are on the MS St. Louis. But first, the day that was after a dramatic night in U.S. politics, a combative Donald Trump took swings at his opponents and the media, then fired one of his top lieutenants. But before we get to why Jeff Sessions is out, here's what Congress looks like so far, even as many of the ballots are still being counted. Not exactly the blue wave that many Democrats have been talking about, but the party did manage to win control of the House of Representatives. So how will this midterm power shift change the way Washington works or doesn't? The CBC's Paul Hunter tells us what's in store. Thank you very much. What's Donald Trump's view of the message to him in last night's midterms? I think people like me. I think people like the job I'm doing, frankly. That's despite voters giving Democrats control of the House of Representatives. But setting aside whatever Trump thinks voters think of him, it's Democrats he now has to worry about. Come January, they'll have an array of new powers, not least to investigate pretty much anything they want. Trump's policies on the environment, immigration, health care, his conduct as president, his personal finances. Trump threatened today, if Democrats investigate him, the Republican Senate will investigate Democrats. They can play that game, but we can play it better. Then there's the biggie. With control of the House, Democrats will also be able to begin impeachment hearings, if they so choose. On that, today from Trump, disdain and mockery. So let's, let's impeach the president, and then we'll impeach the vice president. These people are sick, and you know what? They have to get their bearing. Really, they have to get their bearing. But Trump has little say in it anymore, said the woman likely to lead Democrats in the House, who suggested impeachment isn't a priority. It is their job and duty, she said, nonetheless, to oversee the president. Our committees will make their decisions and make their recommendations uh, to the caucus. But you can be sure of one thing. When we go down any of these paths, we'll know what we're doing and we'll do it right. If indeed that means deep dives into stuff Trump would rather avoid, the president today had another descriptor saying he'd consider that a warlike posture. Signaling politics in the U.S. Capitol are now set to turn even uglier. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Tallahassee, Florida. And the target of those ugly politics won't just be Democrats. Jeff Sessions got a first-hand taste himself today, forced out as Attorney General. <laughs> Staff at the Justice Department gathered to say goodbye as Sessions left the building. Earlier, he'd submitted his letter of resignation, though that first line there certainly makes it seem like it was something else. And Keith Bogue joins us now. All right, so what, what is behind all of this? What should we make of it? Well, what you're seeing is the president girding for the inevitable battle over investigations into himself. As you just saw, Trump threaten Democrats that if they pursue those investigations, he would essentially take the legislative agenda hostage and not move on anything with them, even including those things Trump wants to do too. And as to the firing of Jeff Sessions, that appears to be an attempt to have some control over the Robert Mueller investigation into his campaign and its ties with Russia, as well as his business deal dealings. Okay, so he's, in essence, he's trying to get ahead of things, I guess, or what he thinks might happen. So what can the Democrats do about either of those things? Well, in the first instance, they can refuse to be bullied by the president into not holding him to account because, if nothing else, their base simply would not stand for that. But there's not much they can do about who Trump's, Trump appoints as attorney general to replace Jeff Sessions, except to make a public fuss about it and point out that maybe the president's appointee shouldn't have the authority to oversee the investigation into the president himself. Let's remember that we are not in the same place we were when Sessions recused himself from overseeing Mueller mm -hmm. because he'd been part of the campaign that was under investigation. We now know how close the investigation is to the, to the president himself, and some of his most senior advisors have already been indicted. Okay, and what about Mueller in all of this? Where, where will this leave him? I mean, I'm surprised at the speed at which this has happened, so I don't know how he would be reacting to it. Yeah, and it's a little too soon to say, but we do know that Mueller has an ability to surprise. His investigation has led to people that weren't on the radar of any journalist. Mm -hmm. He's dropped indictments out of the blue that no one was expecting. So it's likely that he's anticipated Trump trying to undermine him in some way, and he's planned for that. But what that means, 
We don't know. So it's worth remembering that last time Trump fired someone in a senior Justice Department role, that was FBI Director James Comey, the firing only brought Trump more trouble. Okay. Keith Bogue, again, in Toronto tonight. We might keep you here. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. But it isn't just the threat of investigations Donald Trump may need to worry about. Last night, an energized group of voters supported a new group of candidates. A historic number of women were voted into office last night. 108 so far, but that number could still go up. Pennsylvania is sending four of those women to Congress. And as Stephen D'Souza tells us, for the women who make that, helped make that happen, last night's result has them determined to keep going with an eye on 2020. Raised half a million dollars. Yeah. The seeds of last night's victory in Pennsylvania were planted in this living room two years ago. A realization after Donald Trump was elected that sitting on the sidelines wasn't an option. You have to vote, and not only that, you have to take the day off on election day and be a poll watcher. You have to help work the polls. You need to be canvassing on the weekends. That it's so much more than our democracy requires of us. Some direct Rebecca Davis helped found Moving the Needle, a grassroots group that took on the Republican political machine in suburban Philadelphia. They started with municipal races last year. But if we don't stop it at the ground level, it's just going to continue to rise. The money, the donations, the contributions, it just... They just start filling the coffers of the Republicans, and we had to cut that off. Thank you so much. Their work helped elect one of the four women Pennsylvania is sending to Congress. But far from revel in success, they say this movement is just getting started. I hope it's not the culmination yet. I hope this, this is just the beginning of what we can do. Across the country, white, suburban, college-educated women overwhelmingly rejected the president. What was a message sent to Donald Trump last night from women from the suburbs of America? That you need to be held accountable and you will be held accountable. But white women did not vote as a block last night. Republicans were favored among those without a college degree. This group knows that bridging the partisan divide may be their biggest challenge. But I hope that other national leaders will see that they have a lot of people who aren't going to sit back and watch politics play out. A political force that has woken up and isn't going to rest. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, Swarthmore, Pennsylvania. Not surprisingly, Canada is watching the shifting power dynamic in the U.S. very closely, especially when it comes to the future of the new North American trade deal. As far as any lingering tensions, well, President Trump doesn't seem worried. A quick question on the USMCA. Now that it's been concluded, have you repaired your relationship with Prime Minister Trudeau? Yes, I have. We have a very good relationship. It's not quite as rosy, though, as Trump may think. Yes, Ottawa wants the deal ratified, and it's launching a campaign to get that done. Though when that does finally happen, uh, as Katie Simpson reports, you might not actually see the usual celebratory photo op. It was 1992, under the San Antonio sun, the leaders of Canada, the U.S., and Mexico stood side by side for a NAFTA signing ceremony. But that kind of staged fanfare may not happen for NAFTA 2.0. I can't imagine some kind of a celebratory uh, event uh, as long as those tariffs are in place. Canada's ambassador in Washington says unless the Trump administration lifts tariffs on Canadian steel and aluminum, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau won't be taking part in any celebrations for the deal known as the USMCA with Donald Trump a shot aimed at a president obsessed with image. We will conduct our business and, and sign on to what we agreed to, uh, but uh, I, you know, we'll hold the celebration until we get rid of those tariffs. The decision comes as Canada reassesses its relationships in Washington, with the Democrats poised to take control of the House. The power shift is prompting Justin Trudeau to call on his inner circle once again for a charm offensive, a coordinated effort to lobby U.S. lawmakers on both the benefits of ratifying the USMCA and killing the tariffs. That'll all be enormously important because there are so many new faces, not just in Congress, but also with governors. Canadian industries that enthusiastically support the USMCA, including auto parts manufacturers, are not afraid at this point that the change in power will put the deal in jeopardy. They're just hoping it will be ratified soon. I think it's an opportunity really to help the company grow its revenue, but also grow the number of people we employ in each of the regions we operate. 
Ministerial trips to Washington have yet to be announced, but the government wants those high-level conversations to refresh the Canada-U.S. relationship so the next two years are not as tense as the last two. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Ottawa. Turning now to a political skirmish over where a convicted child killer ought to be incarcerated, just part of the uproar over Terry Lynn McClintock's transfer to an Indigenous healing lodge. She was convicted in the 2009 murder of eight-year-old Tory Stafford. The decision to move McClintock sparked a fury of criticism from federal conservatives. And now, as Evan Dyer explains, the government has responded. Tory's killer was convicted of the most heinous crimes imaginable. Something Earlier this fall, the official opposition spent weeks criticizing the government after McClintock's transfer. The Conservatives are terribly upset that I referred to them as practicing ambulance chasing politics. But if they're upset, it's probably because it stings a bit. Conservatives said the real outrage was the permissive treatment of a child killer. She belonged in prison, they said, not in a healing lodge with no bars or fences. Tory Stafford's father made it clear what he wanted. To me, this isn't even a political issue. Somebody clearly messed up, made a mistake, and I'm just trying to get this mistake reversed. The Trudeau government insisted that only corrections bureaucrats can decide where individual inmates go, but politicians do control the rules that public servants work under, and today Ottawa issued new criteria that appear to mean McClintock's going back to prison. It will apply to uh, circumstances going forward and to circumstances existing now. So this could apply to Madame McClintock? Yes. From now on, female inmates will need to be near the end of their sentences and have good behavior in prison, both of which would seem to disqualify McClintock. On the Hill, though, the rancor continued. Now that he has finally acted on this, will he do the right thing and apologize to the Stafford family for politicizing this issue? And will he apologize? The Minister of Public Safety asked the Commissioner of the Correctional Service to review the transfer decision in question and their policies on offender transfers. Apropos of that last exchange, it's a shame McLean's magazine didn't have a hypocrite of the year award for parliamentarians. Goodell won't say where McClintock is, but says the Stafford family will be the first to hear about any change. No, no. And yet today no, in I Woodstock... Haven't I haven't received any information from victim services, corrections, Goodall's office, um, nobody. Not regarding anything. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Ottawa. Let's take a look at some of the other stories we're tracking tonight on The National. A community centre near Edmonton still under lockdown after two explosions last night. CBC News spoke to a 16-year-old on the phone who was there. All of a sudden there was like a huge like bang and like the whole building was shaking. The blasts rocked a community center in Sherwood Park, both coming from the parkade. The first uh, around 6.30 mountain time. Police then found a 21-year-old man injured inside a vehicle. He later died in hospital. The second explosion was less than two hours later. Police didn't say anything about a motive, but it appears they believe the man who died was the only person responsible. My sweet Jesus. If it could have come through the fence. A little bit more and it would have been. Oh my God. A close call at Halifax Stanfield Airport early this morning when a cargo plane overshot the runway, stopping just meters from a road. The 747 bottoming out. A fire broke out near the tail section, but investigators don't yet know why. Four people on board were treated for minor injuries. Still ahead on The National, the testy presidential news conference that's now cost CNN's Jim Acosta his White House press credentials. Plus, this Remembrance Day marks the 100th anniversary of the armistice that ended the First World War. Tonight, the story of the Canadian who was killed just moments before the fighting was called off. And trust online ratings? Maybe not. After our next story, we investigate an emerging industry that promises to improve a doctor's online rep for a price. They promised that they would get rid of the three worst ratings. I don't feel this is a Canadian way to work within our public health care system. For roughly 5 million Canadians who don't have a family physician, the website RateMDs is a popular resource for finding the right care, like TripAdvisor for travel or Yelp for businesses and restaurants. RateMD lets people post reviews of health care providers. But those reviews aren't always a reflection of reality. Turns out the ratings can be influenced by the hidden hand of 
reputation management. As Kelly Crow explains, it's an emerging industry with companies offering to improve a doctor's online reputation for a fee. Ottawa gynecologist Dr. Sony Singh was shocked by a recent anonymous review on the doctor rating website RateMDs. The individual who I don't know who they are or where it came from uh, alluded to the fact that perhaps I had done surgery uh, without their consent. It hits you right in the pit of your stomach. Then just as suddenly the post disappeared. In the middle of all that, Singh was contacted by a salesperson from Rate MDs, offering him a package of reputation management tools for a monthly fee of between $200 and $400. They promised that they would get rid of the three worst ratings and also help me become the number one uh, banner profile on Rate MD for my area. Over half of Canada's doctors are rated on Rate MDs, whether they like it or not. Anyone can put a doctor's name on the site, and once it's listed, there's no way to remove it. Doctors can hide up to three bad reviews if they buy one of RateMD's promotional packages, and if they stop paying, the reviews reappear. We take a picture of their search results every day. That's why some doctors are hiring special reputation management services, like Matt Earle's company, reputation.ca. What comes up when you Google that person we try to make it so it's good, positive information about that person. His strategy to generate positive ratings and push the negative ones right off the Google search engine's radar. He provides doctors with special software and tools they can use to encourage patients to write a review. If the review is a good one, the patient is prompted to post it on RateMDs. The net result of that is you get more reviews that kind of lower the negative ratings on RateMDs. RateMDs is owned by the company that publishes the Toronto Star. Company officials declined a broadcast interview, but in an email said, we're certainly aware that there are a number of companies that support healthcare providers in soliciting patient reviews and in assisting with posting those reviews. I don't feel this is a Canadian way to work within our public healthcare system. Um, and I think at the end of the day, to have companies who can help boost your rating or make you look better, then becomes part of the problem. Dr. Singh has declined to buy any reputation management services. Kelly Crow, CBC News, Toronto. One other thing Kelly discovered is that doctors can have a stellar rating on rate MDs even if they've been disciplined by their regulatory college. That includes transgressions as serious as sexual assault on patients. Rate MDs said it would like to add disciplinary notices in the future. Still ahead on The National, Donald Trump takes on reporters in an extra testy news conference today and follows up then by barring a CNN reporter from the White House. We break down the throwdown in our moment. And next, we go in depth in our weekly dispatch. Now, Ayad takes us to Belgium for the remarkable story of the last Canadian who died in the First World War. His blood runs through my veins, and I'm very proud of him. But I know he didn't want to be there because he didn't want to shoot anybody. Remembrance Day is this Sunday, and it's a particularly meaningful one because this year marks 100 years since the end of the First World War. Almost half a million from Canada and Newfoundland fought alongside their allies in Europe, and many never came home. By the time an armistice was signed on the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month, more than 61,000 had lost their lives. In tonight's Dispatch from Mons, Belgium, the CBC's Nal Ayed brings us the story of the soldier who was the very last to fall. It is Sylvan Pat's forte, chiseling memories out of stone. But this, a monumental job, this. A Belgian shaping the story of a young Canadian killed in the fog of an old war into a remembrance still relevant in today's peace. 
it's important to conserve the the history for children for many years. A hundred years after the Great War ended, countless of the simplest memorials still stand. A headstone, a name if they were lucky. In one Belgian cemetery, enemies in life still lay together in death, along with the last Commonwealth soldier to die in the war to end all wars. Killed on November 11th, 1918, two minutes before the hostilities ended, was 26-year-old George Lawrence Price from Nova Scotia. Reminders of his life survive. A record of an early misdemeanor at home. His conscription papers. And... So you've never seen these before? No, I haven't. The stoic postcards he sent to his little sister Florence. I still think of you and we'll see you soon. Be from Brother George. That sister went on to have her own children. George, her brother's namesake, is now 90. Heir to the grief and love and whatever was left of the uncle he never knew. They were hanging on her wall. Including that picture now hanging on his wall. It's his family. It's part of me. His blood ran through my veins, and I'm very proud of him. But I know he didn't want to be there because he didn't want to shoot anybody. What also survives? Different stories of how exactly Uncle George lost his life. That morning, word went out of an armistice at 11. Yet in one version, Price still leads a patrol to check out a building. According to Art Goodmurphy, who was with him, he spoke to CBC in 1965. Well, when we got to the bridge, on a little knoll or hill off to our right, we could see Germans mounting machine guns. So Price said, let's go outside and see what's going on outside here. So the two of us went outside, and all of a sudden, bang! One shot came from way up the end of the street. Got him right through the back and through the heart. And he fell dead right in my arms there. It was not an accidental shot, it was a sniper like, you know. And I went right up to Major Ross and told him that Price was killed. Oh, gee, did he blow a fuse. The war's over, he said, the war's over. And poor old Price, he never knew that it was over, you know. He was just doing his job. Being last, a tragic distinction that lifted Price from certain anonymity. And a hundred remembrance days later, Sylvain Pat is shaping a monument in his name. He chose bluestone from a local quarry to make art that reflects the destruction and to remember a young man whose death symbolizes the futility of war. For me, uh... Pourquoi commémorer juste une personne Donc en même temps, c'est George Price, mais c'est tout le monde qu'on commémore un petit peu. Quoi. Price had just survived the last hundred days of brutal fighting and watched so many others die. To just miss that moment, the carnage is declared over, and later the victory march in the main square in Mons a city that still hasn't forgotten the Canadians who set it free at tremendous cost. There are tributes in more than a few corners. As there are in Le Rhin, near where he actually fell. There's the school. Et ça, la photo originale. And just down the road, a neighbor with her own little piece of the story. 28th Bataillon. Marilyn Lahaye doesn't know where her husband got that picture, but she always shares it with visitors. Et alors moi, mon mari m'a dit, Marilyn, tu gardes cette photo et tu ne donnes à personne. Mais un jour, je sais pas, euh, j'ai voulu montrer cette photo, et c'est ça qui a tout tout déclenché. <laughs> 
More than three decades ago, the city named this footbridge after George Price. And now as the time comes to mark 100 years after he was killed in the dying minutes of the Great War, how do you bridge the past to the present and keep his memory alive and relevant in the modern world? A lot of thinking has gone into that here. L'Heureuse plan for November 11th has been months in the making, overseen by Corentin Alentambi, age 26, the same as Price when he was killed. He was killed somewhere around here. Somewhere around here. Yes. Yeah. He too has heard the stories, including the more romantic version, which had Price walking over here to say hello to a young woman. He crosses that bridge and is then shot by a sniper's bullet to the heart. How does such a tragedy look through the eyes of a 26-year-old now? It's strange because this guy uh, was from Canada, a uh, city in Canada, and he died in Europe, not the same country, not the same continent. And all those young persons came to save a country, save um, more than one country, save an, an idea, an idea of freedom. The challenge here is how to tell that story. Back across the George Price footbridge is where they will gather this weekend to remember him. My sculpture is uh, too, too proud. Part of the plan. Many light, many shadow. Is unveiling Sylvain Pat's monument. Why so many angles? For me, symbolize many facets for the world. Yet, of all the monuments to Price, none perhaps speaks of the enduring sentiment here than the rose just given his name. We know that uh, these roses will travel around the world, and uh, it's, uh, yes, the, the message of peace that George Price gave uh, us his life during the war. We keep uh, hope, and we think that the future will be better than in the past. <laughs> Back on the shores where Price grew up, his nephew, George Barkhouse, is planning to return to Belgium. I'd like to be able to be pay my respects back to the people again for what they've done. Going with him is his granddaughter, Sylvia, for whom November 11 has always been personal. It was always something that had directly affected the family, so it was always something you knew at the back of your mind that, oh, okay, yeah, these are real people. This. This meant, these people meant something to somebody. After a lifetime of telling the story, the inherited pain lingers. And this is the little flower knitted flower. Along with the most precious of mementos, a knitted flower from Price's fiance, colored by his blood when he was shot. Can you tell me why it's so precious to you? Because it's a contact that I lost. And an uncle I never knew, nor will made me never. Pardon me. <laughs> it still catches me. It's, uh, the facet for In the Pat's world. vision of Price too, there is a drop. Whether it's blood or a tear, is in the eye of the beholder. Are you happy with it? Yeah, I'm very happy. One wasted young life. Now a permanent reminder of the pointlessness of losing so many in a place that didn't forget. Nalayed, CBC News, L'Heureux. Belgium. What a remarkable story. I'll be hosting a Remembrance Day special on Sunday starting at 10 a.m. Eastern on CBC Television and CBC News Network. And later that evening, we'll bring you a special edition of The National from the War Memorial in Ottawa. Next on The National, 79 years after a boat full of Jewish refugees was turned away from Canadian shores, the Prime Minister apologizes.
We apologize to the mothers and fathers whose children we did not save, to the daughters and sons whose parents we did not help. We'll show you more of the apology ahead, and you'll meet some of the people who are on that boat, hear their stories, and why today meant so much to them. Next. Here are some of the other stories we're following tonight on The National. A new poll suggests Calgarians don't support hosting the 2026 Olympics. I don't see a huge victory today for either side, but I'm also a guy who knows with five days to go, there is a lot that can change. The poll commissioned by CBC News shows only 35% of Calgarians who can vote in the upcoming plebiscite want the games, 55% opposed, 10% undecided. Now, provincially, it's a different story. 51% of Albertans would support hosting the games, 36 opposed and 13 undecided. The plebiscite takes place next Tuesday. BC's hate crime unit is looking into this security video from a Vancouver SkyTrain station. Police say the man seen here yelled obscenities and homophobic slurs at a couple. When one of them tried to move the man away, he hit that person in the face and spat at that person's partner. The couple treated for minor injuries. A week and a half after the deadly Lion Air crash in Indonesia, Boeing has issued a safety bulletin to crews flying that same type of plane, the 737 MAX. Investigators say the Lion Air plane had a faulty sensor that delivered incorrect data on four flights. That same model is used by airlines here in Canada. In the spring of 1939, just before Nazi Germany launched the most devastating war in human history, a shipload of desperate Jewish refugees sought safety in Canada, but they were coldly turned away. Some would later die in concentration camps. Today, Canada apologized. We apologize to the 907 German Jews aboard the MS St. Louis, as well as their families. We also apologize to others who paid the price of our inaction, whom we doomed to the ultimate horror of the death camps. We used our laws to mask our anti-Semitism, our antipathy, our resentment. We are sorry for the callousness of Canada's response, and we are sorry for not apologizing sooner. The Prime Minister's words were warmly welcomed by Parliament and by Canada's Jewish community, even though they were a long time coming. It's been 79 years since that ship was denied safe port in Canada. Saul Messenger was one of the passengers, just a boy then. In the end, one of the lucky ones. Saul told us about his memories of that time and why the Prime Minister's apology matters. I had my seventh birthday on this ship. So I remember a lot. One of the strange things was, you know, we, we went to have breakfast and the waiters were all Germans and they treated us like normal people, you know, not like Jewish people, like, just like passengers. It was, the first day was sort of shocking because that's not what we were used to from Germans anymore. It was a beautiful ship and there was a pool on the top deck. So it was the first time I ever swam in a pool. It took two weeks to get to Cuba, and they weighed the anchor in the harbor. And people said, well, we're getting off the ship. Why are they laying anchor in the harbor? We should have pulled up to the pier. The next day, we found out that the Cuban government had invalidated our visas. Just said they don't exist. We had paid for them. We had paid for passage on the ship. So everybody was very 
depressed and scared. You know, we knew if we went back to Germany, we had no home to go back to. We had nothing to go back to. We'd be put in a camp. I was standing at, uh, on the deck and uh, I saw my cousin, who was a year older than me, and I yelled, Edith, Edith! And I remember the woman next to me looked at me and said, shut up, I'm trying to talk to my relatives. <laughs> Captain said, "Look, uh, we're not we're not going back to Germany. Don't worry. But you know, everybody's thought, where else is he going to take us?" Two days before we were supposed to land in Germany, we got word that four countries in Europe had agreed to split the passengers up: England, France, Belgium, and Holland. And we ended up in Belgium. I remember that camp very well. The place that they put us in looked like army barracks. There was no furniture inside, there was just hay on the ground, and it was the end of October, it was cold already. There were lice all over the place. For dinner, we would have all of what they called soup. It was water with some greasy spots on it. My mother and I actually escaped on Christmas Eve because the French soldiers were drunk. And uh, on New Year's Day, when my mother looked and four men were coming towards us, and one of them was my father. He had escaped on New Year's Eve. That picture with the little boy, it always makes me think that could have been me. When you think of all the Jewish people who died in Europe during the war, you know, about six million, uh, you know, we were incredibly lucky. The Canadian apology, it's the right thing to do. And uh, it's really important for Canadian youth because it's important for them to hear Canada say we were wrong and uh, we hope that we would never do that again. I think it's important. You can read more about the stories of the people on board the MS St. Louis on our website and see more pictures on our Instagram page. Follow us at CBC The National. Just a few days ago, Donald Trump mused about using a softer tone. Then the midterms happened, and so softer, well, it didn't exactly happen during today's very chaotic news conference at the White House. The president took questions from a packed room of reporters on a wide range of topics, and it led to some, well, heated, the least we can say, heated exchanges, including one with CNN's Jim Acosta. That moment and those that followed is our moment. I think you should let me run the country, you run CNN, All right. and if you did it well, your ratings well, let me would be ask, much better. If I, if I may okay, ask one enough. other question, Mr. President, if I may, if I may ask Peter, one other ahead. question, are you worried? Of, that's enough. That's enough. Mr. President, I, well, that's I was going to ask one of the, one of the, the other folks. That's had, enough. Pardon me, ma'am. I'm, I'm, Mr. Excuse President, me. That's enough. Mr. President, I had one other Peter, question, if I may ask, are you worried about indictments coming down in this investigation? <laughs> Mr. President. CNN should be ashamed of itself having you working for them. In Jim's defense, I've traveled with him and watched him. He's a diligent reporter who busts well, his Well, I'm not like a big fan of, of yours either, so. When you report fake news, which CNN does a lot, you are the enemy of the people. Go ahead. Mr. President, 
Why Excuse are you me. pitting Americans Peter. against one another, sir? Peter, what are you trying to be him? To be clear, though, the question is, why sit, are you sit down? Peter. But the question, but, but you didn't answer my question, Mr. No, President. No, no, no. Just wait, just wait. If it's unfair to the country and it's costing millions of dollars, why don't you just give him the mic, it? please? I've answered the question. I'll give you voters. I, I will give you voter suppression. You just have to sit down, please. I didn't call you. I didn't call you. Excuse me, I'm not responding to you. I'm talking to this gentleman. Will you please sit down? Would, excuse me. Excuse me. On the campaign trail, you called yourself a nationalist. Some people saw that as emboldening white nationalists. Now people are also saying- I don't saying know why you'd that say the- that. That's such a racist question. So tonight, Jim Acosta from CNN tries to go to the White House, finds out his access to the White House, which he's had for years now, uh, has been revoked. The White House says it's because he placed hands on that young woman who came up to get the microphone. You can look at the video, and pretty with a Reuters reporter right next to it said, that didn't happen. I mean, I don't care, Rosie, what somebody's politics are, how they feel about Trump. This is a problem when the president acts this way towards reporters from many organizations. Yeah, press and free press is important to democracy. And I should point out that in this country, no politician can take your access to the press gallery here in Ottawa. So we are protected in that way. That's The National for Wednesday, November 7th. Good night, everyone. Good night.